Good morning, Grace. Sitting there thinking of my own children and how devastating it would be if my own children never knew of the love of God. My, my children won't exist in a world where they don't know that and hear that. But the majority of children around the world do live in darkness and have no idea of God and his great love for them. So anyway, we thank the Lord for the work of the shoe boxes. Today is the last Sunday to build a box out in the foyer there. You see all these giant cardboard boxes up here. Those are all filled, I think, with 15 shoe boxes a piece. And so let's continue to uh, serve the Lord and minister and send little little messages of God's love for his most precious creation uh, around the world. So let's continue to do that uh, this morning. And then if you do have shoe boxes at home tomorrow, uh, by 10 o'clock is the last day to bring them here. So bring them here and then we'll load them up and get them out of here. I'm going to make sure everybody has a copy of the notes. Anybody need a copy of the handout this morning? Everybody squared away. As always, on the back side, you will see things happening here at Grace. We have uh, carols and cookies coming up, women's gala, our Christmas Eve uh, morning service times are on there. They'll just be regular as normal. But make sure you check that out this week and get those things on your calendar. I'm willing to bet that not a single one of you got up this morning and by some sheer act of will tried to get your heart to pump blood through your body. It probably just happened. Uh, Probably until this very moment, you haven't even thought about it. Apart from if you have a condition or a pacemaker or something. Why are we, why am I thinking about it? Well, I'll tell you. What's, (laughs) yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, my heart's beaten. But you don't really think about it. You just wake up and it does what it does because that's how God created it to function apart from some problem. Uh, the same with our breathing, our lungs just work. We don't wake up and think, oh man, what do I got to do to keep my lungs pumping today? What do I got to do to keep my heart pumping today? And well, thank God, that's how we're created. One of the things that is apparent through scripture over and over again is that all the things that God created He created to worship him. They will worship. We are creatures of worship. Uh, It's repeated throughout the Psalms. It's repeated throughout the creation narrative. It's it's repeated throughout the New Testament and the Old Testament. And we're familiar with some of the verses. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Things are created to bring God worship. Now, out of all the created worlds... Apart from the angels and the angelic hosts, we are the only creation of God that actually gets to decide what we worship. So I'll make the case this morning. It's not unique to myself. It's a a theological question and, and truth that's come out of study of the scriptures by many people. But that God created us to worship just like he created our hearts to pump. We will find something to worship. Now, what makes us unique from the created world is we get to choose what that thing will be. But we don't choose. I would make the case this morning. We don't choose whether or not we do worship anything. What we do get to choose is what will be the object of our worship. I want to define some terms for us this morning. So we're talking about the same thing. There's many definitions for the two terms we're going to have in front of us this morning. And sadly, I don't have these on your notes. So if you want to write them down, you can write them down. But our two terms this morning are worship and idolatry. And this is how I'm defining worship for us this morning. That worship is recognizing and responding to God's worth. Two components, to recognize and respond to God's worth. Now, we often think of worship as a parallel, as an equal to singing songs of praise. Now, praising the Lord is one component of a life of worship. Studying the word is an act of worship. Praying is an act of worship. Giving is an act of worship. Ministering to your brothers and sisters by your gift is an act of worship. These are some of the ways we respond to what we've recognized about who God is. So worship is recognizing the worth of God and responding to it. Recognizing and responding to the worth of God. That's what worship is in its proper place. 
And then there's idolatry. And idolatry is a little different. It's still the act of worship, but it's worshiping something created for our manipulation. Idolatry is worshiping something created for our manipulation. Something that we have placed in the place where God should be. We've elevated something or someone, and it can really be anything, to a place where we ascribe that worship because we think we can manipulate it or can control it. We'll look at different illustrations for that in our own lives. We've seen this in the life of Israel through the prophet Isaiah time and time again, is that the Jews, the unbelieving Jews had been drawn astray into paganism and it rejected God and become atheists. They just integrated God into other pagan worlds acts of worship, and they began to relate to God as someone who could be controlled and manipulated. We looked at this last week, and we see it even in the very first chapter of Isaiah. God says, I don't, I don't care for your bulls and your goats and your sacrifices, because you're, try, you're doing them to try and manipulate me. You're not doing them out of a, a respect and an understanding, out of a recognition of who I am, and then responding to that. You think I'm something that can be controlled and contrived and manipulated by your acts of service. And I'm not that. I am God. And so recognize that. And so he has these severe warnings for the people of Israel because of their idolatry. And one of the reasons why God is so severe, and he repeats this idea over and over through the book of Isaiah, is because the nation of Israel knew Full well who God was. He references back to Egypt, to the Exodus. And even following out of the Exodus, uh, the Israelites, the Jews, those devout Jews would have recited this prayer known as the Shema every day, once or twice. It was a prayer that comes out of Deuteronomy chapter 6. It goes like this. You have it in your notes there. But hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. It would have sounded like this. And Eileen can correct me if I'm wrong. A Shema Israel. Adonai Eloheinu. Adonai Ichad. Which is the Shema. And it goes on to say, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. This was a prayer that was before the nation of Israel regularly, daily, a recognition that there is one God and he's the God who created all things and rescued us. And there is no other God that was at the heart of their relationship with Yahweh was their recognition that there are no other gods. It's just Yahweh. And they lost sight of that. They lost sight of that. And when they lost sight of that, it brought judgment. It brought Punishment, it brought torment and destruction, and it brought shame. And in our section this morning, God would tell us, as he's going to remind Israel, that to worship anything other than God will always result in shame. Not sometimes, not occasionally. To worship anything other than the one true living God will result in your shame. It might take some time. We don't know how long, but it will result in your shame. So turn with me to Isaiah chapter 44. That's what we'll pick up this morning. Isaiah chapter 44. We're actually going to jump down to verse 6. And we'll see God do a, a, th- a couple things here that he's already done before. He's just repeating. He's repeating and reiterating, calling Israel back to this recognition that I am the one and only God. And this is my relationship to you. So we'll read in verse 6. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God who is like me. Let him proclaim it. Let him declare it and set it before me. Since I appointed an ancient people, let them declare what is to come and what will happen. Fear not, nor be afraid. 
Have I not told you from of old and declared it? And you are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? There is no rock. I know not any. Once again, we see God giving them a list of his characteristics. He, he's calling them to recognize who I am and to respond to it. What is it? What is it? He titles. He, he lays out these titles. The king of Israel, Israel's redeemer, the Lord of hosts. And that's the Lord of armies. He's the first and the last in the in the Greek New Testament. We call that the alpha and the omega. It's the Hebrew equivalent. He is the first. He's before all things. He's above all things. He knows all things. He says, this is who I am. You need to recognize this. You are going to worship something. Worship the one true God. And so he gives these identity markers. He is the only God. He's trying to reestablish his supremacy in the mind of his people. And then once again, like so often we've already seen in Isaiah, he sets up a courtroom scene again in verse 7. He says, who is like me? Let him proclaim it. Bring him in. Let him speak it out. Let him declare it. Let him set it before me. You, you worship another God. There's someone else worthy of your worship. Bring him in. The picture I got, just kind of an illustration, was like a prized fighter. Like a, like a heavyweight champ who's had a hundred battles and has a hundred knockouts. And he just stands. He says, who's next? Who is next? Bring them here. Bring them in front of me. Just God's way more magnificent and superior in that way. So he says, bring, bring your gods before me and let's see who is like me. Let's test them out. And what's the test? What's the test for the God? The end of verse seven. Let them declare what is to come and what will happen. That's the test. And we'll remember as Israel, as God would select prophets for his people, he had a way to test whether or not a prophet was from God. And that was, he said, if a prophet comes to you and they say they're from me, test them, have them predict an event that's going to happen. And if they're my prophet, I will tell them what's going to happen and they will tell you and that will come to pass. And you will know that they are a prophet from the living true God. He says, you have a God, you have those you declare to be God's. Bring them before me. Bring them here. Have them lay out the course of history. Have them tell us what is going to happen. Have them tell us. Have them declare what is going to take place. And so he says, this is the test. Bring them forward. And it's satirical. It's sarcastic. It's a rhetorical question. Why? Because no gods can do that. Gods are just the gods they worship. They tried to manipulate. Those gods weren't above Creation above time could see the future. They didn't have that resource available to them, much less actually control what's going to happen. God says, bring them before me. Let's test them. And God, the test, the same test lies at the feet of God. Okay, well, so God, are, are you able to do that? And he's already shown time and time again in Isaiah. He's prophesied that the Assyrians would come and conquer, but they wouldn't conquer Jerusalem came to pass. He prophesied that Babylon would come down following Assyria in destruction and destroy Jerusalem and destroy the temple, which is going to come to pass. Prophesied that they're going to be exiled throughout the land, but then somehow they're going to be brought back into the promised land and have the temple rebuilt. That will come to pass. Why? Because God knows the future. It's not a difficult, challenging thing for God to declare what is going to happen. He's reminding his people, I, I know the future. I know what's going to happen. Test your other gods to see if they do. See if they do. Bring them before us. Because God has already been proven in that category. And so he stands there making this call. Bring your other gods. Bring them. We'll see who is God. And so he seeks to remind his chosen people of his nature and his character towards them. That he is their redeemer. Not just a separated God, but he loves and cares for them and wants to draw them out and rescue them again. Because God knows it's not just about God desiring his own glory, although he does and he deserves it. God knows that to worship anything other than him will result in utter shame. Always results in shame. 
And then God goes on to give us a picture and to describe and illustrate just how foolish and how ridiculous idolatry is. This is an incredible section of scripture we're going to read. It's unlike anything else in Isaiah. But we're going to see the shame, we'll see the foolishness, and we'll see just the ridicule that lays at the feet of those that worship other idols. He starts with the severity and then he kind of moves to a section of satire that's actually kind of funny. But we'll pick up in verse 9. All who fashion idols are nothing, and the things they delight in do not profit. Their witnesses neither see nor know that they may be put to shame. Who fashions a god or casts an idol that is profitable for nothing? Behold, all his companions shall be put to shame, and the craftsmen are only human. Let them all assemble. Let them stand forth. They shall be terrified. They shall be put to shame together. You see this idea repeated three times in this section. They will be put to shame. Those that build idols, those that join with them in idolatry, they will be put to shame. The very thing they place their faith in will abandon them in their time of need. Then he moves on into this section of satire in this parable. It's in verse 12. The ironsmith takes a cutting tool and works it over the coals. He fashions it with hammers and works it with his strong arm. He becomes hungry and his strength fails. He drinks no water and is faint. It's describing the man who's going to make the tools to make the idol. It says the man, he comes with a strong arm. He's a metal worker. He's going to make the tool and, and then he gets tired. He needs to stop. He needs to eat. He needs to rest. He needs to take a drink. This is the one who makes the tool to make the idol. He continues then to the carpenter. Verse 13, the carpenter stretches a line. He marks it out with a pencil. He shapes it with planes and marks it with a compass. He shapes it into the figure of a man with the beauty of a man to dwell in a house. That word to dwell just means it just sits in a house. He cuts down cedars or he chooses a cypress tree or an oak. And lets it grow strong among the trees of the forest. He plants a cedar and the rain nourishes it. Then it becomes fuel for a man. He takes a part of it and warms himself. He kindles a fire and bakes bread. Also, he makes a god and worships it. He makes it an idol and falls down before it. Half of it he burns in the fire. Over the half he eats meat. He roasts it and is satisfied. Also, he warms himself and says, aha, I'm warm. I've seen the fire. And the rest of it he makes into a god, his idol, and falls down to it and worships it. He prays to it and says, deliver me, for you are my god. They know not, nor do they discern, for he has shut their eyes so they cannot see, and their hearts so that they cannot understand. No one considers, nor is there knowledge or discernment to say, Half of it I burned in the fire. I also baked bread on its coals. I roasted meat and have eaten. And shall I make the rest of it an abomination? Shall I fall down before a block of wood? He feeds on ashes. A deluded heart has led him astray. And he cannot deliver himself or say, Is there not a lie in my right hand? We just picture this, this. It it goes from satire to shame quickly. But just think for a minute this this picture of the one who makes the tool and then he gets exhausted and he gives it to another guy. And that guy goes out to cut down a tree to make an idol, but he gets he needs to get warm. So he takes the very wood that he's going to later worship, cuts it in half so he can burn half of it and stay warm and cook over it, cook some bread and cook some meat and be sustained. And then he's going to turn the other half into an idol. Now, we're a little removed from idols. Uh, We don't make wooden idols, most of us. I did happen to see this this week, um, which I'm going to bring out. And uh, please don't worship this. And if you want to know where I found this, it was in front of Elder Bob's house. 
So we had a little chat. We laugh because it's absurd. The idea of worshiping a block of wood made by human hands is absurd. We'll get to this in a minute, but that's because we're so much more scientific and sophisticated about our idolatry. That we would, we would say, of course we'll never worship this. But the irony, the satire is equally for us. But of course I wouldn't bow down and worship this. And that's the picture he gives. Is you, you labor, he labors, he eats a meal, he stays warm, he builds this, this thing that's lifeless and dead, that has eyes but can't see, that has ears but can't hear, has a mouth but can't speak, has feet but can't walk, has hands but can do nothing. And you would worship that. This is all idols. This is all gods. They are as blocks of wood. And it's even beyond that he worships a dead, lifeless thing. All through this satirical parable that God is giving are these signs of God in there. The creativity of the metalsmith. The creativity and the excellence of the woodsworker, the craftsman. The very trees that are planted, that grow strong. He says he plants a tree and then who is it that waters the tree? God does. God brings the rain and brings life to a creation. The trees, the very trees that sing his name, that grow strong, the oaks and the cedars and the cypress. And they glorify God. And what does he do? He cuts it down. He takes the life away from God's creation To build something that's dead and lifeless to worship. This is the picture of shame that someone would bow down before a lifeless idol in a time of need and cry out, deliver me, deliver me for you are my God. And just as a note, in times of trouble is oftentimes one of our chances to see the things we worship. Because what is it you turn to in times of trouble? What is it that you rely so heavily upon? Is it your relationships with people? Is it uh, your financial security, the power, prestige, your position? In times of trouble, when the rug's pulled out from under us, oftentimes it will show us if we're relying on something other than God. But here this man bows down to this. And we see it as absurd and ridiculous. And it is. It's satirical. The picture that God is giving through Isaiah is just pure satire. It's just this absurd, ludicrous picture of someone building something and then elevating it over them in worship. This idolatry to worship something that they've created to manipulate. Oh, deliver me. I've Done what you need, so deliver me. And this is the shame that's described. The bowing down to a wooden block. The shame that that would be. And not just the, the worshiping of it, but actually, and this is a truth, this is, this is a, another truth that is innate in our world for us as God's creatures. Whatever it is that we worship, we become Like. You will become like the thing you worship. For us as followers of Christ, we worship the God of the Bible as revealed through Jesus Christ and inspired in the Holy Scriptures that are given to us. And as we worship God through Jesus Christ, by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, who is it we seek to become more like? Christ, Christ likeness. And as we worship God through Christ, we become more like Christ. We become more compassionate, more understanding of the truth, more self-sacrificial, more humble. More of our life is devoted in service to God and his plan for us. The more we worship him. The minute we stop, we begin to worship something else. We're always worshiping something And the picture that's given to us of this man is clear. The language isn't an accident. It says the man is is blind. He cannot see. He cannot discern, though he has eyes. He cannot understand. 
he can't even realize that the wooden block that he's holding and worshiping is a lie. Because he's so darkened. There's a picture given to us in the Psalms. I'll have it for you on the screen. Psalm 115, 4 through 8 lays it out clearly what happens when we worship something other than God. It says, their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths but do not speak, eyes but do not see. They have ears but do not hear, noses but do not smell. They have hands but do not feel, feet but do not walk. And they do not make a sound in their throat. Those who make them become like them. So do all who trust in them. And this is where the satire turns to shame, is that the man who has created the idol now has become like the idol. He has eyes, but he cannot see. He has ears, but he cannot hear. He has a mouth, but he cannot speak. Hands, but he can't save himself. Feet, he can't run. He's trapped in darkness and idolatry. And so we see the satire move to this point of shame where what he trusts in will eventually let him down. It will be his point of shame. And as we think about our lives today, like I said, we're far more scientific and sophisticated than to worship something like this in our culture. But let us not be naive that paganism and idolatry is on the rise in our culture and in our churches We'll have a little bit of time this morning to think about, but I encourage you, if you're not in a home group, that's the place where we're going to really talk about some of this stuff. We don't have carved bears. This is Elder Bob is not an idolater. This is a little welcome bear outside his house. Do you need to clarify that? I didn't clarify it in first service and we had some serious problems. <laughs> because the way we can see the things that our culture worships the idols of our culture is one of the ways is by seeing what is sacrificed because part of worship, it's not just recognizing, right? But it's responding. You recognize and respond to God's worth. And so for those of us who are seek to honor and worship the Lord, it's, it's more than just sitting there and recognizing who God is. It always moves us into action. And so we can reverse engineer our, cultural idolatry by what's being sacrificed. And on the altar of our worship of a desire for sexual pleasure without repercussions, the freedom to do what we want with our bodies, we've sacrificed millions and millions of unborn children. That may be the greatest idol. The, the physical pleasures may be, if it's not the greatest, it's one of the greatest idols of our culture. That the, uh, Another one, our pride in our self-image. And this one's particularly tempting for men. But within our homes. And what do we sacrifice when we worship pride in our self-image? We sacrifice our families. We sacrifice our marriages. We sacrifice our children. We sacrifice relationships because I won't say I'm sorry because I'm not wrong. And if you want to live in my house, this is the way it goes. This is how it works. And so you bend the knee to me. So we're always willing to sacrifice something. One, one thing that's particularly true of the, of our younger brothers and sisters, but also for some of us as a temptation is an idol is our public image. Our social media proclaimed image. You want people to see you and think about you in a certain way. So you spend all your energy in worship of your own image that you put out for the world to see. What do you sacrifice for that? Well, for one, you sacrifice the ability to actually have real relationships. To look someone in the eye and talk to them and have a conversation you're so consumed by what is out there or what's in here on your phone. Do people like that picture? I haven't gotten enough. It's been an hour. I've only got 10 likes on that image. I've only gotten five shares. I've only gotten a couple comments. I need to put something else out. I need to generate. I need to generate some other like. I need to generate some other. 
some other image. I need to clean up my image or make it more attractive or whatever it is. As you promote yourself through social media, through the electronic representation of yourself. And what happens? You become like that. Dead and lifeless. Unable to actually engage in real relationship. Why? Because that's not real. It's not who you are. You don't want people to know who you actually are. And it's become your idol. And you actually become like it. You become lifeless and dead and stale. And people don't want to engage with you. And then it feeds itself. I think the more that takes place, the more you're driven into your phone. The more you're driven into your social profile. One of the most striking lines is in verse 20. It says, he feeds on the ashes. He feeds on the ashes. The man who builds the idol, the half of which he burned to stay warm and to cook. He feeds on the ashes. Idolatry seeks to satisfy our God-given drive to worship. It's as if when you're hungry or thirsty... You reach for dirt and ash to satisfy those God-given desires. Of course you would never do that. Why? Because it would kill you. It wouldn't take too many times to realize that you're dead. But when it comes to our soul, it doesn't die as easy. It doesn't cry out in the same ways as our bodies do. And so idolatry, but idolatry is to our soul what ashes would be to our physical health. And the last truth for us to think about, and I think it helps direct our prayers and it helps direct our understanding, particularly we're, we have Thanksgiving coming up. We're going to spend time with family. Maybe we haven't seen in a while. We're going to hopefully prayerfully have good, rich conversations about God's preeminence, God's supremacy, God's love, God's character, things we're thankful for. Many of us have family that aren't believers, maybe hostile to it. Trapped in some form of idolatry. Maybe it's a worship of material goods. Maybe it's a worship of their pride, their self-image. Maybe it's their pleasure, the sexual, the sensual pleasures of the world. For someone who is trapped in idolatry, the, the truth is clear. They are unable to see themselves out of it. They're unable to be set free on their own. And so it is by the grace of God alone that he will open someone's eyes to see the truth, open someone's ears to see the truth. So I would encourage us this week as we go into the Thanksgiving time and we're going to have conversations with those that have yet to place God in his proper place of worship, that our prayers would be that God would open their eyes and ears because you and I can't do it. And they can't do it themselves. And so we pray for that opening We pray for that opening of the ears. We pray for our unbelieving neighbors and family and friends that they might hear and understand and become the worshipers that God has intended them to be. Let's close with a word of prayer and then we'll join our hearts and minds and voices together as we sing to the true God for who he is and what he has done in worship. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. Reveal in our hearts and in our lives the temptations that we have towards what idols we have in our lives. The things that we sacrifice for and the things that we worship that would take your place. God, I pray that as we seek to follow you, that our souls would be so in tune with our desire to worship you that it would be as though we were feeding them ashes When we're not worshiping you. In the same way that our bodies cry out, God, help us to be in tune. Holy Spirit, may our eyes be open, our ears open to what you would direct us in. Convict us as you, as only you can, Lord. We love you and trust you. We now look forward to singing your names and celebrating your goodness and thanking you this week uh, for your blessings in our lives, seen and unseen. We thank you for your patience with us and we see your patience with the nation of Israel and you, we experience the same patience with us, a God of long suffering who desires us to be set free to worship him. It's in Jesus name we pray. Amen.